Next, we have uh, Vanderlei Martins, who's going to talk us a lot about the, uh, the satellite imagery and the types of works that he does with the CubeSats. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a professor in the physics department, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our work uh, with the sun, pollution, clouds, and climate, and the relationship between uh, these things. <clears throat> So when you have sunlight reaching the top of the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, so part of that sunlight gets reflected back to space. But part of that sunlight gets absorbed by Earth's atmosphere or gets absorbed by the surface on Earth and contributes to warm the planet. So that's the energy driving force that keeps our planet as we know it today. Now, Part of that energy that gets reflected back to space does not contribute for warming up the planet. And the part that's absorbed by the atmosphere warms up the atmosphere of our planet. So I will focus on these two topics in red. So the light reflected back to space and the energy of the sun that gets absorbed by uh, our atmosphere. So that light is reflected by particles in the atmosphere, and by clouds. Now, we all have heard about uh, greenhouse effect and climate change, global warming in general, and the effect of CO2. So by adding CO2 to the atmosphere, we are increasing the greenhouse effect and we are making our atmosphere warm. So I just want to use that as an example because I want to give you another perspective, a little bit more information on that. So the CO2 effect, the greenhouse effect, is on the order of two watts per square meter. So that's what's warming up the planet due to human pollution. The other components of the atmosphere, clouds and particle pollution in the atmosphere, the main effect that they have the solar light is to reflect that solar light back to space. And that has, in general, an opposite effect. So that would have an effect of cooling the planet, of cooling Earth because of the energy that gets reflected back to space. Now, a gas like CO2, when you disperse that to the atmosphere, it gets homogeneous distributed very quickly and goes around the globe and everywhere you have more or less the same concentration, more or less the same effect. Clouds, as you know, when you look at the sky, they're very variable and you see very different clouds in different locations, different times of the day, and they change all the time. And so are the aerosols, or the pollution that we have in the atmosphere that we produce. So when those particles are emitted to the atmosphere, they don't get homogeneous very quickly in the atmosphere. So they travel. They can travel very long distances, as you can see with the dust coming from Africa and going all the way across the Atlantic and reaching the Americas. Or as you can see with biomass burning in the Amazon, that uh, can travel and go to the ocean and mix with sea salt. So those particles can also travel long distances, but they're very, very variable. And you can see here several examples of that. So sea salt in regions of high wind speed, biomass burning in Africa and uh, in the Amazon in South America, uh, sulfate pollution particles in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, those particles are emitted everywhere, but they um, have high concentrations in some regions, and they travel all around the globe. So they have very, very variable effect. Now, <clears throat> those particles directly affect clouds on Earth. So there would be no clouds on Earth if it wasn't for particles in suspension in the atmosphere. So every single cloud, every single droplet in the clouds on Earth's atmosphere is formed around a pollution particle. I shouldn't say pollution, because natural particles also. So you have particles emitted, for instance, by forests, biogenic particles that are in the atmosphere. Water vapor will condense around those particles and will grow as cloud droplets and will form the, the clouds uh, that we know. Now, because those particles are essential for cloud formation on Earth, they also control the cloud properties. So here, if I have a case where um, the atmosphere is clean, and you have particles, but very low concentration of particles, the cloud droplets will form, and they will grow much larger. So you're going to have large cloud droplets 
and that's the first thing that's needed for precipitation, that the particles can grow large enough and rain and fall. Now, as you add pollution to the atmosphere, as you add more particles to the atmosphere, you have now more particles to share that water vapor, to share the water, and as a result, you have clouds with smaller droplets, having much more numerous cloud droplets, but much smaller sizes. Smaller sizes reflect more light, so you have now more light being reflected back to space and contributing to that cooling effect that I was talking about before. So as a result, you have brighter clouds due to the excess of pollution, excess of particles that you have in the atmosphere. Now, for the same reason, because now you have these smaller droplets in the clouds, it takes longer to rain, or it's more, the cloud is less efficient in terms of producing precipitation. So the cloud will live longer, again contributing for uh, reflecting more radiation back to space, but you will also affect the water cycle and will take longer uh, for a cloud to precipitate. So we're basically changing that whole balance. And then finally, also by adding those particles, the cloud, cloud because of the smaller droplets, have now the opportunity to grow deeper and you have much deeper convection, much taller clouds. You know, we have measured clouds in the Amazon that are up to 10 miles in depth. And uh, then you have ice particles on the top of the clouds and the storms can go stronger, and there are many effects that come from that that we don't understand very well. So I'm giving you here some of examples of this effect on how we are, as humans, changing our environment and producing huge effects around us, but we don't really completely understand these effects. So because of that, as part of our work here at UMBC, we have proposed and we have now been developing a small satellite that addresses this type of questions. And this is the HARP satellite, which is designed to measure clouds and to measure aerosol pollution, measure both together and help us to answer this type of questions. So HARP is actually a small satellite, so it's the size of a loaf of bread. So it's a very tiny satellite. And if you have a chance, today, this afternoon, after the talks, Swing by the physics building, in the first floor, we have the satellite there exposed, so you can see a real model of the satellite with the right size, with all the properties um, in the building, and we have other demonstrations there for you to see. So you can see here on the hands of uh, one of our engineers here at UMBC, so the instrument that does all the measurements. So it's a very tiny camera that has a lot of um, important properties and can measure things, like you see all the yellow uh, drawings below the satellite, so seeing the clouds and the atmosphere from many different perspectives to make those measurements. So this is a real piece of hardware that was designed and built here at UMBC as a model for future bigger satellites. So we would like to go from the loaf of bread size of satellite that we are developing today to do these measurements to a school bus size of satellite where we can do all the measurements that we need. Not really because I just want a bigger satellite, but because we can add more measurements and we can have more things done simultaneously. So then what are we doing here? So as I was saying before, so the science behind um, our HARP satellite is to look at pollution, anthropogenic particles produced by man and emitted to the atmosphere that are affecting our environment, that are affecting clouds, that are affecting precipitation, and you study how all those processes happen. So those are things that we are doing here uh, at UMBC in collaboration with other institutions, including NASA Goddard. And uh, just as an example, so when you look at a cloud or when you take a picture of a cloud with your camera, you see the image that you have on the top there. So you see the white clouds with their variability with their distribution. But when HARP, when our satellite look at clouds, HARP doesn't see that. HARP sees the image that you have below. So HARP sees all these colors. HARP sees all these rainbows because of the way the instrument is developed. So that's designed so that we can tell what are in the clouds. And we can measure things like this that tells us the size of the droplets inside the cloud, that tells us the pollution around the clouds, and we can measure simultaneously the cloud and the pollution around it. So this is a small satellite that we have been developing here at UMBC, but with a very great ambition. 
And it's a small satellite that will make lots of measurements. And we have our students involved, our faculty involved. And we really have a great ambition for these measurements and for the future. Thank you.